it's nice to take a little time <clears throat> before we begin just to at least visually connect with the folks. Uh, also okay, of course, to use the chat to connect with the community. And we'll get started in just a minute or so. And I'm sure you've realized by now that Shelley's not here tonight. Uh, Shelley is in the middle of their week-long uh, teacher training through Insight Meditation Society. And I uh, just got a text from Shelley. And uh, as always, it's intense but really fruitful uh, connecting with the teachers and her core cohort of wonderful uh, Dharma teachers that she's in training with. Maybe some of you have seen them on Tuesday evening, this program the Dharma Among Us that Shelley started with the other 20 or so uh, people in the teacher training program through Insight Meditation Society uh, every Tuesday night. So you can get to know some of these other wonderful teachers that are getting trained now. And for folks who don't know me, my name's Mark Nunberg, and I'm the guiding teacher at Common Ground. And I recognize some of the faces and some of the names, and it's really nice to be here tonight. And we'll follow the usual schedule. And I don't know if anybody's here for the first time, but if you are, maybe say hello, wave, or something like that if you want. And uh, in any case, a big welcome to you. Thanks for coming. Glad you showed up. So. Uh, Shelley Graff, um, Common Grounds Associate Director and the other staff Dharma teacher is usually here to uh, lead the Wednesday night community practice group. And so we'll have a guided meditation to begin. And I know some of you are probably reading along in the book that Shelley's been teaching from, two of our senior teachers in the early Buddhist tradition, Kitasaro and Tanisara, and the book, um, I think it's listening from the heart. And uh, Shelley's been teaching or was planning to teach from chapter four, which is um, Kitasaro writing about the five jhanic factors. And um, I'll, I'll kind of review them during the guided sit tonight. Um, yeah, so feel free to just listen and let what I'm saying, let these instructions really from the Buddha just the fact how we show up to our present moment experience. So do what you can to feel at home in your body, in your posture. Make those adjustments and let it be a simple act of compassion as you take care of your body. Find a posture that works for you. So the topic that will talk about tonight, discuss together <clears throat> the five jhanic factors are really these particular qualities or capacities of our heart that when they work together and sync together brings about a unification of the mind that is very healing very pleasant in an inner sense and also very conducive for the heart, for the mind seeing things as they are, having insight. So as we're just sitting, we're not meditating, we're not doing anything right now, we're just aware that the body's sitting here aware of the sound of this voice, aware of the ordinary tensions here in the body. We 
aware of seeing, even if, even when the eyes are closed, there's still visual experience happening, being known. And then as we're recognizing this initial capacity just to be here in the moment, not lost in thought, the first muscle we're going to get a sense of, the Pali word is vitaka. It means to use thought to help attention connect to one's experience. So for example, if we use the instruction, breathing in, experiencing the breath, breathing out, experiencing the sensations of the breath. So those are thoughts, that's a thought that helps the attention connect with the simple experience of the breath coming in and the breath going out. And it's a particular mental muscle for the attention to be directed by thought to something that's real here and now, like the touching of the air as it goes in through the nostrils, and then the touching of the air as it goes out through the nostrils. Or you might be feeling that rising of the abdomen, the abdominal wall as you breathe in, and then the falling or contracting of the abdominal wall as you breathe out. I get really curious about that particular specific mental muscle of connecting. Where we're using just the right quality of effort, not too much, not too little, that allows that intention to connect, to fulfill its intention. And this muscle of connecting is usually developed in sync with the second muscle of sustaining. Before we can sustain one's attention with the present moment using a particular experience like the sensations of breathing in, sensations of breathing out. First, we need to intend to connect. Breathing in is like this. Breathing out is like this. And then it's a different quality of the mind of effort to sustain, to keep that experience of that breath in mind, to keep it in mind, to not forget. The connecting is a more assertive quality of the mind, and sustaining attention is a more receptive quality of the mind. And we want both of those qualities active now. And we're not saying that this awareness of the breathing process is somehow more special than any other phenomenon. We're just saying that this is a very helpful training. We're using the breath 
to develop these two particular mental muscles of connecting and sustaining. Connecting attention to the present moment and sustaining attention with the present moment. And one way to do that is to use the sensations of the breathing process. It's not the only way, of course. And you might catch yourself trying too hard. And you might catch yourself not trying hard enough, not caring enough. So the whole point of the training is to find the sweet spot. Where the heart cares enough to connect and sustain present moment awareness. And we're using the breath as a training ground. In a sense, connecting and sustaining are two aspects of curiosity, interest. And we're learning to cultivate this unwavering, not scattered, not broken continuity of present moment awareness. But remember, it doesn't require the body or the mind to be tight in any way. And we're totally okay about beginning again and again when this attention is broken or distracted. It's helpful to do this only one half breath at a time. Just that sustaining through the in-breath without any gaps. And then sustaining present moment awareness through the natural out-breath. Again, without any gaps. And remember to relax. Interested in the breath as this natural phenomena, physical phenomena.
And what a relief that we don't need to control it. However, the body is breathing will be fine. It's easy to take the distractedness personally, like a personal failing. I'm no good at this. And of course, when the mind identifies with those thoughts, then the continuity of present moment awareness will be broken. And that's just how it is. We don't need to stop those thoughts from arising and that wouldn't really be possible. The training is not to be confused by those thoughts. So let thoughts, whatever they might be, they might be quite neurotic, they might be beautiful thoughts, but let the thoughts just be there in the background. And we're cultivating this particular interest to connect and sustain present moment awareness. We're using this working ground, this training ground of the physical breathing process, either feeling the touching near the nostrils or more generally as the rising and falling of the abdominal wall or wherever the sensations are clear for you. 
And as you get some momentum where you're able to stay in touch, stay aware of the breath coming in and the breath going out, and begin to notice this more inclusive sense. So as you're breathing in, sensing the totality of the whole body sitting. And each time as you're breathing out, be aware of the whole body. So more and more inclusive awareness as you breathe in and as you breathe out. And notice has, how that has a calming effect on both the body and the mind. And so in a way, the breath, the rhythm of breathing in and breathing out begins to spread a sense of calm and tranquility throughout the body. But this can't be forced. It's just something to observe when there's some momentum of connecting and sustaining. And it's really the beginning of joy. PT, which is the third of the five jhanic factors we're talking about tonight. So there's connecting, sustaining, and then this mental quality of joy, this buoyant, energized, you could call it joyful interest. The mind becomes enlivened. It's finding some delight in connecting and sustaining. So of course, for this period of time, we are willingly dropping everything else, all the other concerns and thoughts about the past or future. And we're bringing our full heart to this simple practice, this intention to connect and sustain and to notice the joy that comes naturally with momentum. We're keeping the breath, keeping the whole body, keeping the present moment in mind as we breathe in, as we breathe out, and noticing the calming, really a healing effect of the body. And then joy is born out of that sense of pervasive calm. There's a natural lightness joyful interest that arises when the body is feeling tranquil.
So remember, it's not about the breath. We're using the physical activity of breathing to experience this unification, the mind becoming not distracted. Aware of the present moment with continuity. And feeling the energy, the joyful energy that begins to arise, a kind of buoyancy or lightness, brightness. It fills the space of the body and the mind. It's subtle. You don't need to go looking for, we just begin to recognize it and of course naturally appreciate it as a wholesome quality. And then it will naturally lead to the fourth of the five jhanic factors, sukha, which means ease. It's a more resonant inner happiness, contentedness, an inner satisfaction. as if the heart is relaxing and releasing in a way we didn't even realize that it was tight. So as you breathe in, as you breathe out, if there's enough momentum, then notice this quality of ease as you breathe in and as you breathe out and allow it to naturally spread through the body and the mind. allowing each place to be touched by that sense of contentment and ease. Breathing in, <clears throat> experiencing ease. Breathing out, experiencing ease. And for the last minute or so, the fifth quality to be discerned, the most subtle is ekagata, usually translated as one pointedness, but it could be also described as a sense of still or empty space. So not so much the activity that's happening, but the quiet space of the present moment, the empty open space of the heart. 
So breathing in, sensing this open space of the present moment, breathing out, simply sensing the stillness of the present moment. The background of stillness, don't worry about activities, sounds, thoughts, or whatever. Notice the quietness of the space of the moment. As you breathe in, as you breathe out for just another minute or so. Take a little time, adjust your bodies. <clears throat> Maybe you noticed, but you know, one of the real shadows for, um, whenever we dig into some of the teachings that have to do with concentration, it can really trigger in us both a sense of attainment, accomplishment, look what I did, I had a good sit, my mind got really peaceful, I did that, right? So that's one shadow is somehow getting identified with whatever nice thing happened in our set. And you can guess what the other shadow is, is getting identified with our terrible failure at the meditation and a mind that was distracted and thinking about superficial things or bothered by the pain in the knee or disturbed by some irritating sound or the sound of my voice or whatever it was. And <clears throat> one way or another, you know, we turn these instructions that are really about, more specifically about training the mind, we turn them into something that ultimately we use to beat ourselves up or to compare ourselves to other people. But one way or another, you know, it's just more of the entanglements that entangle us. But <clears throat> the solution to that problem isn't to avoid these teachings. I mean, basically, what's going on here is the Buddha and Kitasaro, the person, one of the people who wrote the book, and the tradition, you know, our wise spiritual elders, those who have come before us and have learned a thing or two about the mind, about the heart, they're just sharing their understanding. And, you know, like an adventurer who's gone off to some 
undiscovered place, but you know, before anybody else, and comes back and gives a little bit of the lay of the land. And that's the way to understand this particular teaching that you'll find in chapter four on the five jhanic factors. So maybe just give me a sense. Most of you have your videos off, but maybe the people have your video who have your videos on. Just maybe shake your hand if you've been reading chapter four. Like, has anybody read chapter four? So a couple of folks, but most of you haven't. Okay, that's that's helpful. Yeah, so I'm going to go through the list one time relatively quickly, and then I'm I'm going to have some time to hear from people. And remember, we're using this list of five mental factors that are related to this basic aspect of meditation that's about stabilizing present moment awareness. And that list is called the five jhanic factors. The word jhana or jhanic, it really means that unification, that absorption, unification here and now in the present moment, as opposed to a mind that's scattered or dissipated or reactive, right? So when the mind is really fully here, we call that mind is stable and it's unified in the present moment. It's absorbed and it has a very particular flavor. So if you work with these five jhanic factors, at least, you know, maybe at the beginning of your sits, then you'll get very familiar. It's actually recognizing these factors that develop them. You bring them to mind, the concept, because you're hearing it tonight, or maybe you're going to read the book or whatever. And then having heard it, then as you're sitting the next time, oh well, yeah, Mark mentioned, or the Buddha mentions this particular mental quality, mental capacity of connecting, this sustained attention, right? So there's connecting, there's sustaining, mentioned joy mentioned ease, mentioned one-pointedness or stillness or a kind of empty space. So these are, you know, they have a, an energetic or visceral quality to them that will help you recognize them. And in recognizing them, you will strengthen them. They will become a more dominant, let's say, stronger uh, quality in the mind, not just when you're meditating, but just generally throughout your life. And in a way that unification, like really showing up where everything in your mind and heart is all aligned in the service of seeing clearly what's happening in the present moment. That's called being a functional, competent human being, right? It's the thing that gets in the way of being a good, competent human being is the scatteredness. We're not really there. Like if we're going to be a good partner or a good parent, you know, we have to have some capacity to be fully there in our interactions. Even to be a good caretaker for this body, I can't be relating to my body in a superficial way. How do I know like whether to keep eating or whether I've had enough if I'm not in that unified, like not caught up in my, no, I really like this dish, so I'm going to eat more, which I tend to do, you know. But having that, you know, the, the sort of uh, image the Buddha uses and uh, Kirasaro mentions it in this chapter, but it's one of the descriptions the Buddha uses for jhana. It's um, this sense of drenching or suffusing. And he, he uses the image of, a, you know, back in the day, you know, 2,500 years ago, they would use some kind of soap powder and then they would work it, you know, knead it, and it be, would become like a soap ball. And every bit of the powder would be integrated with the water that was being mixed in and whipped up and kneaded in a way, right? So that at some point that 
the water, the bath powder would be kind of unified and could be spread everywhere so that no part of the mind and body would be untouched. So what this is the, the kind of direction it goes, but it begins with that more assertive. It has to be a more assertive energy where the mind is leaving behind its habit of being caught up in thought and it's connecting with something that's real here and now. So it's not connecting with the thought of the breath, but the actual physicality of breathing in and breathing out. And so it leaves behind its mental proliferation for a moment with that energy of connecting. And then right there next to it is the energy of sustaining, which is a different quality of effort, different quality of interest, keeping the physicality of breathing in and breathing out or just keeping the present moment in mind. So one is this more assertive intention to connect, to sort of leave behind what I've been thinking about, what I've been lost in with my thoughts, and really wanting to drop in, connect. Oh yeah, this is how it is. This is the next in breath. And remember, it's not about the breath. We're just using the breath kind of as an example of what the mind, the connecting mind, Ritaka, what it can connect with. Of course, the mind, the attention could connect with any number of phenomena in the present moment, right? And then how do we keep the present moment in mind? What's that intention to sustain, to not forget, keep in mind? And one of the ways it's talked about in the tradition is that each of these five qualities of the mind, jhanic factors, helps to remove one of the hindrances, those things that hinder this present moment awareness. So making the effort to connect helps the mind go beyond sleepiness and dullness. And this is just a basic principle that we learn when we watch the mind. Making effort is energizing. We always think, well, I need energy in order to make effort. But actually, it's the other way around. If I do something, I start having more energy. If I c continue to avoid doing anything, what happens? We don't get energized. Oh, I don't have any energy, so I'm going to sit on the couch. Well, does that lead to more energy? Generally not. You know, we get more and more lethargic generally. But if we start to do something, there's energy there. So it's said that that first factor of connecting will remove sloth and torpor, sleepiness. Sustaining present moment awareness with the breath or whatever phenomena we're connecting with, sustaining, not forgetting, keeping in mind, that removes doubt. Because we're, when we can sustain present moment awareness, we're not in the realm of mental proliferation. Like, you know, if I take my hand and I touch my wrist, right, and I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond the idea, the concept that my hand is touching my wrist, and I'm going right to that, the warmth of that pressure and the contact, the sense of weight. See, there, there's no doubt in the mind when I'm in the immediacy of touch or in the immediacy of hearing or the immediacy of seeing or even the immediacy of thoughts just being thoughts. Doubt, arrive, doubt requires the mind entangled with thought, with concept. So if your mind is spinning like, am I a good meditator? Did I hear it right? What the instructions are? Really, I uh, experiment with that sustaining quality. Really notice how you can find just the right kind of interest that keeps the present moment in mind. Now we'll be changing, you know, the breath is changing or whatever you're using, seeing, hearing, whole body awareness. It's gonna be a dynamic thing. So keeping it in mind requires a real particular skill that we can strengthen 
in the mind, how to stay interested, how to value the sustaining of awareness. And then doubt is removed from the mind. And then the third one, the joy that arises, the Pali word is piti. I'm just going to read a little bit from what uh, Kitasaro writes in this chapter. The experience of piti, or this joyful interest, rapture, is a fullness of being. The body and mind become suffused with awareness. We can access piti even in a moment when we remember to savor our experience. Bring attention to your body, and you can do that now. Take, uh, bring attention to your body and then take a slow, long breath. As you breathe out, relax and consciously enjoy the sensations. Do this a few times. And you'll experience the seed of piti, the pleasure that is possible in meditation. There's something enlivening, brightening, and light about being in the immediacy of the present moment. In the same way, even like with relatively good stories and thoughts that we construct with our thinking mind, thinking, even wholesome thoughts, is relatively deadening. <laughs> this is a real insight. Even skillful thoughts, I mean, certainly neurotic thoughts are really heavy. When we, when we can step outside of the little bubble of our heavy thoughts and taste, what's been said in motion, we'll really see, oh yeah, having been lost in thought was deadening, was heavy, was imprisoning in a way, right? But even relatively neutral or wholesome thoughts can be exhausting for the mind. And the Buddha says this in different ways uh, in the different discourses, you know, even spinning with wholesome thoughts is exhausting for the mind. So when we can connect the first factor and sustain present moment awareness, then this lightness, this joyful interest in the enlivened nature of reality, the non-conceptual re reality that's always here, of course, but it's obscured by our fixation on our, you know, the mind's fix fixated on its thoughts about things, its concepts. And that, that creates an obscuration, like I'm attending to my thoughts about this, my mental interpretation of who I am, what I'm doing. And that, that's always heavy and stressful, even when it's relatively wholesome thoughts. And when we connect and sustain, that drops away to a large degree. And then the heart, the mind experiences joy, pity. It's like everything is in motion and because everything is in motion, there's nothing fixed. There's nothing that can be heavy or oppressive. And so even in the very beginnings, if we look, you're going to notice that lightness. Now, remember, part of it, part of the reason that we have a talk like this and that Kitosaro writes a chapter like this is we need to be encouraged to look. So we now have this concept of meditative joy, piti, P-I-T-I, piti, and the I is like a long E sound, piti. So we have this concept of this meditative joy. So then we'll be curious. And especially with that curiosity, remember it's subtle and initially it's gonna be really faint, but by recognizing it there, in a sense in the background of the heart and mind, then it will, over time with practice for periods of time it will come into the foreground more and more and it'll be very apparent the joy as you're breathing in and the joy as you're breathing out and then you'll naturally that rhythm of the breath is kind of like a that massaging or kneading and the joy the intention 
the very natural and appropriate intention is may this joy spread and touch every aspect of my being why wouldn't we right it's a very wholesome inner quality of joy why wouldn't we want it to drench and suffuse and touch every aspect of our being this is really important to hear because a lot of people get this idea that meditation is kind of dry it's like hard work but we do it because we're supposed to so it's really good to hear this aspect of the practice that is very moist <laughs> just to you know use that that simile you know it's it's not dry it's meant to be moist because there's a lot of healing emotional psychological and ultimately spiritual healing that come and it really teaches us this essential truth which is life is hard i'm mean, no doubt about it and there's difficulties in the spiritual life just like there's difficulty in, a, in avoiding spiritual life spiritual practice but the flavor of awakening all along is an inner pleasure it's not like bitter medicine bitter medicine bitter medicine bitter medicine for the first you know 200 lifetimes and then eventually you know we get some joy at the end it feels right it feels good all the way through somebody's asking about the name of the book so shelley has been teaching from the book listening to the heart by two wonderful teachers they're um, a married couple kitasaro and tanisara and they used to be a uh, buddhist monk and nun and then they left we say in the early buddhist tradition they took the robes off and were no longer monastics and became a married couple and they've been teaching um, in the west now for quite a while have a retreat center in south africa actually um, and i think they're both british uh, born in england and you can see you know with this list of five jhanic factors connecting sustaining joy ease one pointedness it's really going from more gross qualities wholesome qualities of the mind to more subtle and so as our you know skill develops taking care of the heart taking care of the heart body and mind which is really what this practice of samadhi this part of practice that's about unifying or stabilizing present moment awareness it's all in the service of seeing things as they are and we're really learning how to use these five factors so when the mind is more distracted and superficial then we're going to emphasize the first two and three and when the mind is more settled the first two aren't that needed so when you're already feeling a lot of joy and then moving into the fourth jhanic factor of ease sukha is the pali word it's a kind of satisfaction or contentedness and it just arises naturally when there's been enough joy enough lightness suffusing the body and mind then the heart goes you know what it doesn't say it in words of course you know what I don't need to go anywhere i don't need to do anything and the visceral energetic sense is like you could even use the word feeling quite held as a visceral expression of that i don't need to go anywhere you know because as a human being we have a lot of doing becoming energy because we're not satisfied right anybody perfectly satisfied right now probably not we got agendas because we're not perfectly satisfied but when we have this deeper internal healing that can come in meditation practice there will be moments when that quality of satisfaction ease contentment will rise up and pervade the body and the mind and in those moments there will be this energetic sense this inner sense nobody has to go anywhere nobody has to become anything and that will feel like 
ease or contentment or satisfaction in a, in a kind of inner sense. Ah, oh, totally okay being here. Right here, just as it is. Don't need the moment to be different. And that's what that fourth quality uh, feels like. Remember, initially it will be quite faint. This is already a subtle quality of contentment, contentedness, and it will be faint. But by now hearing about it, the mind will be naturally a little bit more interested in it. So when you get into a more settled place in a particular sit, then ideally you'll remember, oh yeah, there's that quality of sukha. You know, as a, um, a Indo-European uh, language, Sanskrit, Pali, the word sukha is related to the word sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's sweet. Ease. Ah. Right. So you wanna you wanna be curious. Is there any ease in the body, in the heart, in the mind? Any ease, however faint, however subtle, that's lingering in the moment. So that as I'm like if you're working with the breath, as I'm breathing in, as the breath is going out, could I have that wholesome intention to notice the ease as I'm breathing in, to notice the ease as I'm breathing out. And if to the degree that we can detect it, sense it, even if it's subtle, then there's that natural and wholesome intention, well, may it spread as I'm breathing in, may it spread as, it, as I'm breathing out, right? So that, and this, is a, this would be a very natural intention to arise in the mind. It's not like I've got to want, to recognize the ease, or I got to want to make it spread, that will be a very natural intention because it's a very healing quality. Of course, I want it to suffuse, to drench, to spread to every aspect of this heart, body, mind. Why not? Right? And that, that kind of deeper emotional, psychological, spiritual healing that comes by keeping contentment, sukha in mind, as you're breathing in, as you're breathing out, you see how it helps the other, the most subtle of the five come into view. So ikagata. I really love how Ajahn Sumedho, one of our more senior Western teachers in the early Buddhist tradition, insight meditation tradition, he says about ikagata, this fifth jhanic factor, it's the one point, right? Because it's usually translated as one pointedness. It's the one point that includes everything. And this is where jhana, jhanic fact, it's all about unification, right? So it's not when we hear one pointedness, we are right back with the first factor of connecting. Oh yeah, I got to connect with one thing, like the breath at the tip of the nose or the mantra or loving kindness. If you're doing a, loving kindness meditation. I just gotta be with that one thing. But now we're at a place in the practice where the one thing is the totality of the present moment. So it is one thing, but it's an all-inclusive one thing. And it's important for us to understand this, at least on this intellectual level. So then when we're in the experiential level, it will make sense that the one thing is all inclusive. So we're breathing in. That's why sometimes I'll use the word space because it has more, it's both a thing. Oh yeah, I'm aware of the space, the present moment, but, but it's a very inclusive thing. And the words are never gonna be it, of course. The words we use are just pointing the attention to something that's subtle and true and here and now. It's like this background, it's always here, but it's almost always missed. This background nature of the mind itself, not the activity in the mind, but the space of the mind or the space of the present moment. And this has to do with equanimity, dispassion, and understanding the nature of the mind. This term ikagata and it's it's 
opening and discerning and keeping in mind this fifth quality of ikagata that really helps strengthen that unification, that stability of present moment awareness. Because it brings in this wisdom factor of dispassion that the wisdom in the mind is starting to recognize something that remains untouched, even as disturbing or beautiful experiences come and go. And that's why it's another reason why the word concept of space can be initially useful. Or another image that's used is like a mirror that remains untouched no matter what the mirror is reflecting. And that really helps. Akagata is often associated with that quality of equanimity and dispassion. So these are the five jhanic factors, and I just encourage you to, to learn them, to memorize them. Um, and that way you can, um, you know, just naturally they'll bring to mind, like at the beginning of a sit, even before you sit, you might just remind yourself, oh yeah, through these natural capacities, muscles, you could say, of my mind, the muscle to connect, to things just as they are, the muscle to stay interested, to sustain that awareness on this non-conceptual level, this capacity to experience joy, this lightening or buoyancy, enlivened, bright quality, this capacity for the heart to heal from discontentment, to con contentedness and the satisfaction not needing to go anywhere and this capacity to feel uh, unmoved untouched immune yet at the same time being right in the middle but not bothered by what's coming and going okay with everything that's moving this is the sense of space, the one-pointedness. We're becoming the one point that includes everything, the space of the present moment. So we're not so bothered by what's happening, what's coming and going. So that's probably enough from me. And be really nice to hear from people in the group, your own reflections, what you've been learning, what's been challenging. And, and an, a special encouragement for people who tend not to speak up or share to just really check in with your heart maybe it's okay to take that step of raising your hand uh, we only have 35 folks so you could probably people can just unmute yourselves and uh, jessica's here to help and we'll just uh, look for people who might be wanting to speak but not willing to unmute themselves and encourage you to do that and then after you're done talking uh, let's mute ourselves again so there will be less distortion yeah anybody want to begin the conversation what have you been learning what questions are arising about this topic tonight something for us to experiment with not to believe in. So in little ways, like we can maybe think of a couple of scenarios, maybe one in a meditative sense, and then another more in daily life where we might be feeling dead to the world. And we might just, like the next time we're feeling totally exhausted. And you know, of course, if we need more sleep, we should get more sleep. And I'm a big believer when I can in an afternoon nap. So, you know, I, I think resting is a good thing. Most of us tend to be uh, working too hard. But there are times when dullness and sleepiness is a way for our heart to avoid what's difficult. So that's really where this comes in, where we're feeling heavy, sleepy, and dull because either it's become a habit for the mind, we're averse, to what's going on and initially you know we might be telling ourselves kind of that scolding parent oh you should do this you should do that 
So we might want to change that up in daily life and ask the question, well, what honey, you know, like literally talking to ourselves in a kind way, honey, what are you willing to do right now? What in the whole spectrum of things that could be done are you interested in doing? Well, why don't you try doing that? Because once we start doing one thing, the heart might be inclined to do the next thing or another thing. And we might, in a roundabout way, get to that thing the scolding parent was telling us we really need to do now. Because the, what, what we might need to break through is the idea of helplessness. I'm feeling so tired. I'm feeling so heavy. I can't do anything. So we want to challenge that notion. Well, what can you do? What, what, what are you willing to do? Maybe you're just willing to stand up and go to the bathroom. Maybe that's just the start. Or get a glass of water. Oh yeah, I can do that. I can go get a glass. And it's not like a trick. Yeah, and then I'm going to throw this in. You know, once you get that glass of water, then I'm going to make you do this other thing. We're really just curious about what happens when the mind engages life and does the next thing. And just notice the energy that the relative absence of the sleepiness and the dullness when the mind engages life or shows up. And then like in a meditative sense, it might be like, how about, you know, my mind's really sleepy. So first there's just the recogni recognition that the mind's sleepy. And then you might just ask yourself, well, maybe, you know, would you be willing as you're breathing in to just repeat those words in your mind? Breathing in is like this. Breathing out is like this. And the effort to simply repeat those words silently in our heart might actually brighten the mind, bring some energy into the mind. Or that effort, like another way to do it is like, could you notice in this next inhalation, could you notice more details of the physicality of breathing in? Can you notice the midpoint of the inhalation or the midpoint of the exhalation? So we're making the mind work a little bit because we're asking it to notice the midpoint and just then just see what the effect is. Does it brighten the heart or mind? Yeah, thanks for the good question. Is it Joy? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that out. And I think in the weekly email and maybe even on the calendar um, listing for this evening's program, or possibly last week, Shelley had the scanned copy of chapter four. I highly recommend as much as any of the chapters that you might keep. It's just a nice uh, reminder that there's joy and an inner satisfaction that comes with the practice. Because it because there is so much difficulty that comes with the practice, it's really important we, we remember there's also joy. And it's a healing kind of joy. And like Joy is mentioning, we won't keep doing the practice unless we know how to follow that thread of joy in our spiritual lives generally and specifically in our meditation practice. Doesn't mean it's going to be there in every set, of course. But we need to be regularly in touch with the inner joy that comes or we'll just stop doing it. Do you know where I Make sure that in the weekly email, which you can get on the website if you're not signed up to get the weekly email, when you'll, you'll see in the weekly email that the Wednesday night practice group that's led by Shelley is always listed there. And we'll have the link for the chapter um, there so okay. you can see it next right. week. I'll make a note right now so I don't forget. Thank you. Good. Who would like to go next? Go ahead and unmute yourself. And this came later. I don't think the Buddha made this, uh, talked about this, but in uh, a pretty well-known manual that was written 
in the third century CE, so 700 or so years after the time of the Buddha, they line up the five hindrances with one of each of the five factors. So connecting removes dullness, sustaining removes doubt. You could probably guess joy removes ill will. When there's a lot of joy in the heart, not so likely we're gonna be angry or irritated. When there's a lot of sukha, a lot of that ease, remember I said you feel like held, so restlessness is removed. And then wanting is removed with stillness because that's the very definition of equanimity and dispassion. It's like the mind is enjoying the peace of not wanting. That's really what that space is. You, we can't really recognize the space of the present moment and want something at the same time. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. I forgot, I meant to mention them all, but I spaced out. Yeah, other thoughts about practice or just reflections, questions? What comes to mind? Hi, Mark. This is Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi. Uh, I, I noticed uh, as we were going through the guided meditation, um, uh, when when looking, when kind of trying to pay attention to the seeds of joy, um, that that's uh, I, I was not connecting with it. And then, as as you went through, you know, just the the Dharma talk talking about the different stages again. You know, I was trying to reconnect to them. Uh, and there was a moment when, um, uh, with, without any sort of thought or, or logic connected to it, there was a sort of sudden wave of, uh, sort of an upwelling of uh, just general sadness that kind of moved into, you know, uh, into tears, which, you know, for like maybe, you know, just 10 seconds or so. And, and then in its wake, there was, there was a, a sense of just unburdening or release. And, um, and, and th th it's just something that I, uh, it, it wasn't a, a sadness that was overwhelming or anything like that. It actually seemed kind of, uh, it seemed like it was unburdening as it was happening, as it was right. also sad. Um, and I, I just, uh, it was kind of, something I hadn't experienced before. And um, I'm just thinking about the, the um, sort of either overly focused or doing the work of focusing on these particular qualities that sometimes, you know, just that the effort that gets put towards that. And then what happens whenever it's just, it just kind of comes on its own out of the, out of the, uh, the concentration. And I don't know if there's anything that, um, anything that you would have to say on that. It was just something that I experienced. Yeah. No, I'm really glad you brought it up, Joe. Because even though, you know, in the greater sense, we cultivate the samadhi, this unification, because it allows the heart to see things as they are, to have insight, which liberates the mind and heart. But there's so much psychological, emotional healing that happens because we do this work. I mean, it's, it's really therapeutic. And one of the nice things about the chapter is uh, Kitasaro's stories about he, had, he got typhoid fever when he was a monk in Thailand. And he was basically in bed most of three years and just could not heal. And... Uh, but he, you know, he had his practice. It's basically all he had. And, uh, and just, just the kind of healing that happened. So it will be both emotional, but also a lot of physical healing. Now, that doesn't mean it's not a miracle that's going to cure every uh, physical illness. But it really, what healing, emotional and physical can happen, happens with samadhi. It really allows, it's kind of removing, it's because like another way to describe the experience of unification is 
the heart and mind and body is not working against itself. So everything in the body, heart, and mind comes into sync. And it's what is it getting unified around? What is it coming into sync with? This sort of, it's harmonizing with, love or acceptance or ease it's getting out of the way so that whatever healing emotional and physical healing capacity or built in to the mind body system they can do their work because there's nothing working against it that's what the samadhi or the unification does it removes the distortions or the disturbances that are in our heart, in our mind, in our body, counterproductive, working against ease and health and well-being. And so this is, uh, what this means is basically everybody, no matter how difficult your life situation is, because obviously, you know, if we're starving or if we're being oppressed, it's not so easy to do this kind of practice, right? Because you can see, like, just to have the privilege of having some time to do it that's a real privilege and when we have a lot of other disturbances in our heart because of being mistreated or whatever hungry not so easy to do so but everybody has an incentive no matter how difficult the circumstance to do the best we can to bring to support this natural capacity to be whole that's another way of thinking about unification it's experiencing the fullness or wholeness of a mind or heart that's undivided, not fragmented, right? And the, the truth is, the unfortunate truth is, some of us will have more favored circumstances than others to do this work. And we should support everybody to do it as much as possible. And for some people, it means like feeding them or helping them uh no longer be marginalized or abused right and for other people it's just like staying out of the way and giving them a quiet space or giving them a little encouragement but we have an incentive to develop the heart cultivate the heart train the heart as much as we can given our circumstance given our health given all these factors some of which you know we can't do much about Yeah, thanks for sharing that powerful story, Joe, about your practice. And it's just a testimony to, yeah, the, the kind of healing that naturally, like Joe says, that just naturally percolates up. We don't understand why it arose in that particular moment. But like Joe shared, the takeaway is it felt right. I don't need to explain it to myself. It just felt right what happened. We have time for a couple more folks to share. What else have you been learning or what questions are coming up for you? Someone mentioned about the blog. We'll make sure that that chapter is in the blog too. I know, I think Gabe puts the weekly email in the blog in any case, or used to. But anyway, we'll make sure it's in the blog as well as the weekly email so you can get a hold of it. You know, this is the real thing. And if our practice can't show up here, then really what's the point? And, and one thing that might kind of make it clear is those of you who have raised kids, uh, it's like such an, or those of you who have intimate partners, like I haven't raised kids, but I, I've been in a partnership now for about 30 years, and, uh, or have a dear friend that's really suffering. And uh, it's very interesting uh, to, in a very honest, clear way, to sense how justified I feel getting tight suffering because they're suffering but does my suffering contribute to their well-being no 
but but it just feels so natural to get tight when there's a lot of suffering now this is true when we read the news about somebody who's really in a bad place difficult place or like your example then of being in a meeting or doing social justice work and being around people that are experiencing a lot of difficulties because of that maybe um and it, it can almost feel insulting to somebody's suffering for my heart to be at ease for my body to be calm and to be for my heart to be at ease so in places that aren't too charged start to experiment with this like i'll give you an example that happened i forget if it was this morning or yesterday but the, our cat which is an outdoor cat a lot of the day um caught a chipmunk and uh you know and i don't know if you know the sound of a chipmunk when it's caught by a cat but it has this very high pitched you know and as a mammal i think we i mean it cuts deep you know that sound and so it's like a real training to hear that if there's something i can do or something that when my partner can do then we do it but if there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do. But what we also are practicing is not getting tight because a, a being may be killed or in the, you know, being harmed and hurt and experiencing a lot of pain. So it's really good practice. So simple things like that, or like when you're reading the news about some terrible thing that's happening, you know, another black person gets shot uh in a in a you know terrible inappropriate way and uh you know like what what is a useful way to show up even when i'm all alone and i'm just reading the news on my computer and i'm seeing that like what's going on in my body what's going on in my heart and mind what's helpful what's not helpful what's skillful what's not skillful and not in a judgmental sense but in a like i just I want to show up in a full way here in a way that's contributing not in a way that's adding more suffering so how do i relate how do i hold and that's how we get you basically develop the skill because once you're in a meeting that's like postgraduate level work you know so we have to start where it's simpler it's not so complicated yeah i appreciate the question and I see now it's nine o'clock and we should probably wrap it up. Really appreciate everyone being here. I'll leave the Zoom meeting on for 10 minutes if some of you wanna check in with each other. And I'll just mention a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, usually twice a year we have what we've been calling a masculinity community conversation for anybody who identifies as a male or as masculine. And uh, this coming, Sunday, 12.30 until um, 2 p.m., so an hour and a half. And this is, uh, there's, you know, five of us who facilitate, but it's not really a teacher-led conversation. It's just for us to talk. And to this meeting, we're going to talk about aggression, dominance, hierarchy, and how that is all woven into the experience of being male or masculine, and just learning from each other and uh, yeah having honest conversation so feel free to join in for that we're asking people register for that and it's a zoom meeting and that link and registration information is on the calendar there's a day-long retreat on saturday i'll be leading this one i think patrice kelsch will be leading a half day the first saturday in september yeah and of course many other programs coming up i think shelly probably is still even with the teacher training she's doing they're doing is going to do her um, practice check-in tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So you can join in for Shelly then if you'd like. So really nice to be with you all. Take care. And like I said, I'll leave the Zoom meeting on if anybody wants to stay and say hi and check in with each other. Take care, everybody.